cloud. We got it. Okay, well, we're very happy. Good afternoon, everybody. We're very so happy to have presenting Anita Young and Barbara Closer. Their session name is Everybody Can Learn a Language at PSMLA first ever virtual conference. My name is Isabel Espino de Valdivia, and I'll be hosting today along with Mina Levinson. This session is being recorded. If you're tweeting or posting on social media, we welcome you to include at PSMLA1 and hashtag PSMLA21 so we can see and share all of you can all your thoughts. Our presenters Twitter handles are Anita Young914 and at Senora Claus. Good. Okay, if you would like to tag them as well. For attendance purposes, please make sure that your display name matches the name used to register for the conference. If you're unsure how to do so, please send me a message in the chat and I'll be very happy to provide you with instructions. Please join me in welcoming Anita Young and Barbara Claus. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you very much. Um, and also, uh, thank you, Mina, for having us. We are very excited to be presenting this evening. Um, and as you can see on the screen, our topic is everyone can learn a language. So I, also, we invite you, as Isabel uh, shared, um, we also have the Twitter handles um, for at PSMLA1 um, with the hashtag as well as we have our own unique hashtag for this presentation. So if there's anything specific about this presentation that you wanted to share your thoughts on throughout it, please feel free to share. Um, and then um, we'll tell you a little bit about kind of the program we work with and, and that is our Twiddle handle at uh, the World of Learning Institute as well that you can tag. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and proceed here. And we'll begin by just sharing with you our agenda for the evening, um, just to give you an idea. We'll first address um, the problem and why um, only certain students are taking world languages. Um, and number two, we're gonna focus on changing the mindset. What do we need to do to change our mindset about who's technically good at languages? Uh, number three, we'll take a look at some practical strategies. So things you can walk away with. Um, there are ways to share the benefits with all of our students. We wanna give you some of those ideas and we wanna hear from you of some of the ideas that you might be doing in your um, own institutions and schools. And then last but not least, we'll acknowledge the challenge um, that we may be facing and whatever it may be, the challenge or challenges. And then um, we'll address them and, and maybe we'll try to figure out some strategies to help overcome them as well. So that's kind of the agenda for the evening. So we wanna welcome you. And again, we wanna thank you for attending um, not only the conference, but specifically our session or for those that are viewing the recording, we, we appreciate you watching. Um, my name is Anita Young um, and, uh, and I'll, ha I'll have Barb introduce herself here shortly, but we both are virtual language teachers um, through the World of Learning Institute. The World of Learning Institute is a program um, through Appalachia Intermediate Unit 8 in Pennsylvania. It's an entrepreneurial branch of, of the IU. And what we do is we provide a virtual language solutions um, to schools who um, typically do not require a need full of full teacher, right? Perhaps you only have two or three students taking Chinese or a couple of students who want Arabic. So it doesn't warrant getting a teacher there, right? Um, the other solution we provide is long-term sub situations when schools cannot find a sub that's certified in the language. Um, we are available to do that as well. And our program provides um, virtual instruction. Um, so it's half asynchronous and the other half is synchronous. So we do meet with our students live in Zoom. Um, primarily, uh, a lot of our audiences or, or customers are rural schools who really do not have access to a lot of resources when it comes to languages or, or teachers of languages. But um, prior to this, I was a brick and mortar classroom uh, teacher, Spanish teacher for many, many years. Um, and then um, I switched over virtually about five years ago. Uh, also, I am a native speaker of Portuguese. My family's Portuguese, grew up with languages and then transitioned as a young child, learned Spanish and became a Spanish teacher. I also have two children at home. 
um, a husband who does not speak languages. I don't know how that worked out, um, but he does not. So he is learning as well as my children are learning. So that's just a little bit about uh, myself. So in the meantime, as Barb introduces herself, as we had suggested to some of you who came in earlier, feel free to share where you are at in, in your role um, with languages as well. But go ahead, Barb, I'll have you introduce yourself. So um, as Nadia said, I'm Barb Clauser, and I started working with World of Learning. Uh, I think this is my third year with them, but I do this as an add-on to my brick and mortar job at Hershey High School. So at Hershey High School this year, right now I'm teaching levels five and AP Spanish, um, and also have started a community service pro program with them and support um, the other language teachers as the department chair. So we, we use at Hershey, I kind of can do both sides of it because at Hershey World of Learning, um, we are one of their clients and we offer Latin and Arabic, Chinese and Japanese and also American Sign Language this year. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, is that everything? I think yeah, that's, that's everything. everything. <laughs> so I get to see, I, I'm kind of fortunate in the sense that I do teach the Spanish after school hours um, for World of Learning, but I also get to work with students in the classroom setting and help our um, in-class in facilitators and work with all kinds of students and get them access to languages and things that they might not otherwise have. Um, other than that, this is my 29th year in education. So um, still lots to learn and, and, and enjoying it, but very different the last couple of years for sure. Thanks, Barb. So. Um, so one of the things that we ask of you, um, Barb and I have different experiences learning languages, right? And, and we want to ask you a little bit of how many of you are good at learning languages. And I would presume that many of us in this room would probably raise our hands, right? Um, we're around languages, we teach languages, we're involved obviously in a community of language teachers. Um, so we may consider ourselves good at learning languages, right? So the problem, um, and again, think about our topic again, everyone can learn a language, that term everyone. So the problem is not everyone is, is getting access to a world language. Um, it is, a matter, is it a matter of equity? Is it a matter of bias? What is the reason? Um, so I want you to take a guess here, and I, I would love for you to use the chat box to take a guess. How many students are enrolled in a world language program in U.S. high schools, you can give me a number of students. You can give me a give me a percentage, probably. Uh, give me a percentage of how many students are actually enrolled in a world language program in U.S. U.S. high schools. Just throw out a percentage there in the chat. Let's see what we got. Okay, we've got twenty five percent, thirty five percent, thirty percent. All right. Any other guesses? All right. So let's take a look. But at um, nineteen percent. Okay, wow. um, so it, it's scary, right? And especially as world language teachers, we're probably taken back. Like, why? Why is this so low? Um, so if we were to draw, right? What is the stereotypical language student, right? Let, let's judge a little bit here. Um, who is the stereotypical language student? Good. You can throw in the chat. You can unmute and share. We're we're fine with it. Um, but what would you define? And, and it couldn't be within your own building or outside of your building, right? We all have different thoughts. Anyone want to share? Let me choose. Honors, level one, sad face, college bound. Yeah, often music students. Okay. All right. So we all have different experiences. Advanced proficient English. And I bet we're all typing this probably cringing, right? Like knowing that this is kind of what the reality is and, and why. Um, so um, yeah, as many of you suggested, uh, this is Anna Lynn. Um, she was one of our students for many years, uh, took Spanish with us, um, did very well. But yeah, she was the honor student the academic, um, you know, very vocal, was on the speech team, bright. Um, yeah, th that's great, right? Like that's the stereotype. Um, so how do we change that mindset? Because I know we all, when we saw 19%, got a little worried, right? And then when we think about, there is a stereotype of language learners. Um, and so how do we even go about changing that mindset? Um, and honestly, or have a parent with another language, that's another good one, right? Um, so when I 
as I taught, right, I, I thought the same thing. You know, my school had similar policies, right? Those were the same students signing up for Spanish, right? Um, and I thought something's got to give here, right? And our program specifically with the World of Learning Institute has given us the ability to think a little bit more about mindset and growth mindset and, and changing who is the stereotypical language learner. Um, and I'll be honest, it started with personal experiences too, right? So let's take a look at the first time we learned a language. So how did you learn your first language? What makes us good at learning language? So I wanna show you this video real quick. Let me see if I can. work on that, right? There we go. Yes, okay. Can we see it okay? Can you give me a thumbs up? Did you understand it though? Okay. No. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, no. Not, not this one. This is, this is the grand finale of it. Okay, the last one? Yeah, that's the last one. That's what I was wondering. I don't know what they're going to do next season because they did some stuff this time. Exactly what I was thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, don't bring that in. You know what I'm saying? Don't do the same stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was thinking that, yeah. Yeah. Like go somewhere else with that, but don't break it here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I said. Then it was like, ah, 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 you know what I'm saying? And I was like, what in the world? But don't do it here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Really? I thought the same thing. <laughs> we think a lot alike, huh? <laughs> That's crazy. Right. All right. So let's think about this a little bit. So <laughs> how did you learn your first language? Probably very similar to that young child, right? Um, through just being spoken to, being immersed in language. So what does make us good at learning our first language? So I'd like to kind of just give you a few seconds to think about it. Um, and consider what goes into acquiring learning a language, right? Um, it, it's being spoken to, being exposed, perhaps, um, reading, songs. Um, so when we think about learning our first language, those are the things that we should be considering. We don't know that um, Kingston, right? We don't, we don't know that Kingston's going to go on to honors classes. We don't know that he is going to be college bound. We have no idea. We don't even think about that when exposing Kingston to language. We don't. So why is it then that we do think about that when it comes to our older language learners, right? Or a second language? Why do we even consider that? Um, so key elements of language acquisition, obviously, right? We've got lots of input. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, right? I think we can all believe um, in this. Um, acquired in context, right? Um, repetition, low aff um, affective filter, right? Relational. So yeah, these are all key elements. Um, and if you have any other ones, please drop them in the chat box. Um, reading books, yep. Convince account, <laughs> we're gonna get there. Um, observations, right? So songs, excellent, right? So these are, and a lot of these are input-based, right? Um, but in, in, in context, but this is great. So why, why can't we do that, right? So um, I want to introduce you to someone. Um, this is Mia. Mia is actually my daughter, okay? Um, Mia is currently six years old, uh, Mia was diagnosed with autism at the age of three, okay? She was nonverbal, not speaking, nor English, nor Portuguese, as I hoped, right? Nothing. Um, so obviously, I was a little disappointed. Here I was a language teacher. Um, I spoke different languages. I wanted to speak to my children in Portuguese. Their grandparents are Portuguese. My, my grandmother doesn't speak English. I wanted her to talk to her. Um, unfortunately, my husband and I, when we realized she couldn't even speak English, uh, we made a decision, and I'm going to say we, right, because we both went back and forth. We made the decision to not talk to her in Portuguese, and we thought, let's focus on English. Her speech therapy was in English. 
We didn't want to confuse her. So um, fine and well. And then all of a sudden the pandemic hit. Okay. <laughs> um, the pandemic hit and Mia was home with me. And there was times that I was working, you know, I was doing things. I allowed Mia to have her iPad for certain times throughout the day um, for learning and then kind of exploring on her own. Well, one night, um, Mia, I was getting ready for bed, as you can see in the video here, top right hand corner. Um, she's in her pajamas, her little night mask, and she starts doing this. I had never intentionally exposed Mia to Portuguese nor Spanish because I was afraid. I didn't think she'd be able to do it. On her own, she explored it was involved with songs clearly right was receiving input and learned it she acquired it now is it perfect no way <laughs> um you know no is it perfect absolutely not but it it re it taught me something as a parent because i my mindset was she wasn't able to do it wrong 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 as a teacher wrong as a mother your children all children are able to acquire it, okay? Um, and then I at first I thought, eh, she just memorized the song, no big whoop, right? Then one day we were sitting at the table and I said, and my son, who's two years younger and very ornery, um, was <laughs> misbehaving <laughs> to say the least. And I said, Lincoln, you need to stop. And my daughter turns to me and says, mommy, you need to be Felice. She then used what she had learned in context appropriately. She then kept saying, mommy, I'm Felice, I'm Felice. She kept saying that everywhere. Um, and I said to her, I was like, well, how's mommy now? Triste. She was learning. She was being exposed. My fault, because I didn't do it. But she, I now realized she was capable of it. Estre. So this is Thomas. Um, at the World of Learning Institute, um, after I found out what my daughter was capable of doing, and when I realized the value that every child, I don't care what kind of diagnosis, I don't care anything, they should be exposed to a language. In the meantime, while all this was happening, we were meeting with a particular school district, Bald Eagle area. It's near Penn State um, here uh, near State College. And it's somewhat of a rural school, okay? And I was telling them about my daughter and they said, well, we want Spanish for our life skill students. And I, I didn't even think twice. Most people would be like, wait a sec, wait a sec. That's not college bound. That's not this, that's not this, but no they wanted to expose their students to languages, to all students. So I want you to introduce, I want you to introduce or introduce you to Thomas. This is probably, um, I did a demo with Thomas's class last spring and it was probably on my top five of one of my most memorable teaching experiences. So I want you to meet Thomas a little bit here. Everyone say, hola. Hola. Uh, you ready? Here we go. Hola, Thomas. Hola. Muy... Triste. Triste. Muy bien, Thomas. Sí. 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 In that a... picture, uh, estoy feliz. Clase. Yeah. In this picture. <gasps> ¿Cómo estoy Enojada. yo? How am I? ¿Cómo estoy yo? Enojada. Enojada, good. I'm mad, see? Enojada. So repeat it, right? No. Tell me. See no. or no? no? No, I see no. thumbs down. Muy bien. Clase. Estoy feliz. Sí. 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 Sí.
sí. Sí, estoy feliz. Muy bien. All right, let's try the next one. Clase. Estoy feliz. No. No, no. and I see this too. This works, right? We can do this. Clase. Estoy emocionada. No. 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 Clase. Estoy enojada. No. No. Clase. Estoy triste. Sí. 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 Can I hear everyone say sí? Sí. 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 Muy bien. So, what I can tell you is, um, again, Thomas has a diagnosis. He's in a life skills classroom. Um, but his interaction, his able, he is able to understand um, input, right? Basic input in, in Spanish. He can respond in Spanish. Um, so again, a, a diagnosis or placement in any kind of class should not determine his availability um, to get Spanish, right? Or to, to be exposed to Spanish. So some people are just, um, so we need to kind of consider the mindset, right? So some people are just good at languages, Um, you know, you're not just good at math. Uh, so again, it, it, there's that stereotype, right? That mindset. Um, you have to be smart to learn a language. Um, everyone can learn a language. That is the mindset we need to shift to. So I'm going to kind of shift this over to Barb a little bit because in her role, she's actually in a physical building. So she understands a little bit some of these things going on. Um, so go ahead, Barb, I'll have you take over. Okay. So when we're talking about practical strategies and shifting the mindset, obviously we have to bring in other people because as Anita said before, like we're preaching to the choir here, we're pretty much all on board with wanting all students to have that access to be able to learn another language, get exposure to it, learn about other cultures, what have you. Um, so how can we do, like, what, what are some practical strategies or who can we align ourselves with to maybe help make those pathways open for other students? Um, when we're talking about a role for everyone, um, a whole school can look a whole different, all different kinds of ways. There are some schools that they host a world language week. We did some things, um, my hallway where our building is set up, languages are all in one hallway together. So, you know, the Spanish teachers, we had some recognition for this past month with Hispanic month, just to make other students aware, even if they weren't taking a Spanish class, what did that mean? And what was that about? Um, in our community, we actually teach languages as low as young as sixth grade. And that was actually brought on by the community because we had a vocal set of parents um, several years ago who decided that they wanted to see how low we could get the languages. So we started in sixth grade so they can be an awesome resource and an ally as well. Um, guidance counselors were mentioned in the chat. I think we have to maybe educate them more about what this all is because I think they are very much going to focus, especially on those students who are going to go on to post, you know, whatever they're going to do after graduation, if that's going to be college, they really focus on that a lot. And, and I think we have to change everybody's mindset for that, because even if they're not going to college, exposure to languages is going to help them, you know, just appreciate others, if nothing else. Um, see what students want to do. Maybe survey students and see if there's, you know, an, uh, wanting them to have access to other languages or have exchange. I know it's a little hard right now with the pandemic, that's kind of slowed some of, of exchange um, programs down, but even having uh, technology has opened that up so much. We do an exchange through Flipgrid with a school in Spain because it's asynchronous and we can, we can have that exchange. And the kids get really excited about when videos and stuff are posted from their, their friends in other countries. Um, other teachers especially can be really helpful in the cross-curricular things. Like I said, I work with some of the English teachers. We help support one another. And, and my thread through community services also help that. But getting them on board with, with how you can support them and then sharing stories of what happens. Uh, I think sometimes we forget that and we can be our, our, you know, that can be our best key to getting things out there. You know, making, making friends with the community resource person in your district, whatever that person's role might be. You know, we have somebody in our district who shares all these stories and puts things out about the district, get some stories with language learning involved and that, um, and that can help spread the word as well. Next slide. So accommodations to make 
language learning accessible to all. This is going to look differently, different, obviously, in different schools. I think one big challenge, and we'll talk about this later too, is staffing right now uh, is really, really, uh, you know, something that we're going to to be encountering for a while, I believe. Um, you've got the different people like here, family who already speak Spanish at home. So what can we do for them to support? Because just because we have some kids, heritage speakers, they speak it, they don't know anything about what it looks like or, or even what the proper way to say certain things are. So how can we work with those students? Students in life skills. At our school, we had a Spanish teacher who happened to be covering the lunch for the life skills teacher and ended up turning that was, was supposed to be a duty time into doing mini lessons with those kids and was really wasn't even really planned at the time, but ended up being a really good experience for both the teacher and the students. And it wasn't anything that cost the district any more money because that teacher was going to be in there with those students anyway to cover so the teacher could have lunch. Um, we have a situation here like I am deaf. We had a student several years ago who was blind and, and was gave us a whole new uh, concept of what do we have to do to work with this student to get her to be able to participate in the coursework and also have access to learning the language. And then what happens if you've got students who are out of your building, either go to Votech, might have an internship, maybe they're part-time students because of, of other things that are going on. Like we have some part-time students this year who only are in school for half the day because they only needed so many credits to finish out because they got behind with the pandemic. So what can we do to, to kind of address some of these different situations? So acknowledging the challenge, um, it's it's obviously there, and and the funding is a big part of that. And Nita, you can step in with some of these too. And we're competing with time too, with um, different offerings. Steam is really big. Maybe we can make sure that we're part of the A in that for arts. You know, how can we can combine with maybe what's going on with some of the other fine arts, and how can we find teachers to teach languages in the area. One of the reasons my role in my, my brick and mortar school changed so much the last few years is because I was coaching, I was doing instructional coaching and we had three maternity leaves at the same time. And a week later, we went home for COVID. So like a lot of things came all at one time um, where we had to find, you know, try to find other teachers. So these are some of the real and maybe you know, we would like to know a little bit about what you all are facing and, and are dealing with right now too. Yeah, so I can jump in here. Um, I tend to meet with a lot of the schools that end up being our, client, our clients or at least schools that wanna to talk to us, right? About our services. And a lot of them, it does, it does come down to money, right? Um, there isn't always a giant budget for world languages. So it's thinking creatively um, about, well, okay, then if I can't get a teacher, right, and I can't pay for World of Learning, or I can't pay for another whatever um, vendor, for example, then, then what, what can we do to provide still world language without breaking the bank, right? Um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be offering a class to every kid, but can it be other ways to expose languages, right? So kind of thinking um, outside the box a little bit, and then same thing, we meet with a lot of schools, especially those here in Pennsylvania, right? We, we are now facing career and readiness uh, requirements, you know, the initiative for STEM, and sometimes they just need help thinking about how can world languages be a part of those initiatives? Instead of us being pushed to the side to make those a priority, how can we work together to do this together to meet those initiatives and still have world languages a part of this? Um, so that's really important because we do get a lot of that as well. I, I have to offer, you know, I have to offer a STEM class. I don't have time to offer Spanish. So we get a little bit of that. Um, same things. Obviously, teachers is, is always a struggle. Um, I think some of you that are in city areas, Pittsburgh, you know, central Pennsylvania, Harrisburg area, um, you might have more access to world language teachers. But where RIU is, where I live in kind of more rural central Pennsylvania, um, our office is based out of Altoona, Pennsylvania. Um, it's it's hard. It's really, really hard to find a Spanish teacher, let alone Japanese, Arabic, or anything else like that. So um, yeah, so it's thinking about even if you can't find a person, what other solutions can you find? So go ahead, Barb. Um, so some of the things you know we have up here on the screen, we're not going to read everything to you, but we have other. We may have other access to other resources. And not even realize it. Um, the the whole after school language clubs. 
Um, we at, at Hershey, we do we we haven't for a couple of years, but in the spring we do a huge international fair, and we get our language kids to help the parents that put that together down at the PTL. And that's a good advertisement then for our program too, because the younger kids get not only exposure to the other cultures, but they get to see high school kids and what they can do with language. Um, so what can you do with some of the resources you may already have? Even sending, are we send our high school kids down to maybe work with some of the elementary teachers as well with, uh, in terms of not a full exploratory program, but they help the classroom teacher and they teach them some things along, you know, the, the students, some things in the languages along the way. Community partnerships, uh, that could be dependent on who, what you have. Hershey, we do have a lot of community partnerships and, and Harrisburg is very close to where we kind of have access to, to some other language speakers that could come in and, and help kind of bring that up. Anita, what do you want to add to? Yeah, um, we, we always like the idea of exploratory languages in some way. Um, again, just exposing students to even a variety of languages, right? Um, even as, as early as possible. Um, here's what I could tell you too. We, we recently got a client from New Jersey and I don't know how many of you are up to kind of knowing what the legislation is in New Jersey, but New Jersey just recommended, highly recommended um, all school districts K through 12 to be offered a language, okay? And many of the schools are jumping on board and certain schools with certain requirements have to, um, but they also created a graduation requirement that students have to graduate at a certain proficiency in a language. So um, they're enforcing it a little bit more. I know with Pennsylvania, you know, we're a little behind with that. Um, but considering even if you start small, right, as, as our site says, act small, right? So even if it's, um, we used to do, um, and actually I used to teach at Mifflin County. It's where I first started teaching, um, Laura. So um, we did like a world language week, even in, in March, um, we had a school wide event and just, even if you weren't taking a language, you participated in it. So there's just different things you can do at small levels and then hopefully build it up. Um, once there is parent buy-in, once there's community buy-in, once students go home and say to their mom and dad, Hey, I did this, this, and this, and there was excitement, right? So yeah, I guess the, the big thought is act small. Um, and yeah, let's get our, I think it sounds like for many of you in the chat, um, guidance counselors, administrators, those are kind of a little bit of our hurdles. So how can we address those hurdles? Um, so yeah, we, we'd love to hear from you. If there are things that you guys are doing, you obviously heard from Barb and I, some of the things that we have done and do, but we'd love to hear. Um, and again, feel free to unmute and share, put it in the chat box. Some of the things you might do at your school, um, even to get into different ages, different classrooms, um, be present, share it with the whole school. I know in our district, they got rid of our middle school program probably about almost 10 years ago now. And um, so we don't have that exposure at the middle school level. And that's really like the feeder program when it comes to high school. And so we started going down and visiting the middle schools um, had, when they go to do their course selection we, with the principals when they do course selection just to advertise language. And it's usually the Latin teacher and myself because we have the lowest enrollments and um, simply showing up and letting the kids know that we're interested we get a lot of response and I'll tell you what, I get a lot of kids on, on the spectrum in my classes. Um, probably would not have, but because I was there and did something, they show up. So, I mean, just being present and being interested in them and helping them with, with course registration was huge. And Katie, you guys don't have a restriction or you know, policy on who, who can sign up for languages. It's kind of hard because it has to, our, our high school has, has shifted its um, scheduling. So the kids only have six classes a day, um, okay. seven, yeah, six, seven, six, um, because one of them's lunch. And, you know, it limits the amount of classes they can take. And as freshmen, they're required to take a lot of things. So we do end up getting the higher end kids. Um, and we're working with the guidance counselors about that. But it's become clear that some of the kids who are, you know, I've got one who's really on the Asperger's autistic spectrum um, and he's a real challenge in class, I'll tell you, but you know, he, they allowed him to come in and take this class. And I've had kids come out of um, um, disability services into my classroom where they take it as their only non, again, only regular course in the entire spectrum. Um, so that's, that's always a challenge, but that's why I was interested in this. 
Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and obviously I heard just it, in what you said, obviously scheduling is always a challenge, right? Um, <laughs> so yeah, that, that's a tough one. Um, and obviously it'd be nice to say, hey, let's just offer more offerings. Let's make it fit, right? So what is the solution then, right? Um, you know, after school, is there anything that can be done? Anyone else want to share? Hello from Mifflin County. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe like two years ago, they decided to add eighth grade because we were still ninth through 12th. Um, they decided to add eighth grade as like a pilot program. Now they, they do look at the kids like English scores, so they take Spanish one instead of their reading class. So we still only have seven classes in a day. Um, so they do look at their like PSSA scores, their English scores for them to take Spanish. Mm -hmm. Um, but unfortunately my colleague last year retired and they didn't replace her position and somebody from our high school left as well. And they didn't replace this position either. So I'm the only one in the building. Wow. So yeah, so it's, and we have two now up at the high school. So I, I teach, I just got added a section of two because I was just one for, for a while there, which is fine. Super excited to have something a little bit different in my day. But in terms of expanding it, there's, I, I teach six classes a day. There's, there's literally no way. I do a Spanish club after school. Um, I want to do next year when I have a little bit more time, I think to do something for like Hispanic heritage month, like have like a scavenger mm -hmm. hunt through the school or something like that. Um, but in terms of, of time, I just don't have it <laughs> because between this and then I have about three other jobs that I do and I'm an, I'm an advisor of three different clubs, like, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> no, we after my own heart. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So um, I've, got a, we'll I've got to recommend the scavenger hunt. I did that this year for German American Heritage Month for October. And I just sent out an email to the staff and asked them to send me any connection they had to Germany. I got a huge list. I picked 10 oh, of the, awesome. the, building the kids have been running around. So I, I highly recommend that. That's a well, great that's a connection to other colleagues then too. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I like Especially that. Especially those kids that haven't been in the building for almost two ever yeah. for them to find out where the music classes are or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. So um, I do want to leave some time if there are any general questions, because we have a, about five more minutes. Um, but I, I, again, I just want to say thank you. Um, and kind of some of the, if, if you wanted to reach out to us, ask any more questions or anything, um, I'll leave that up on the screen, but we do want to leave it open the last couple of minutes. If anyone has any questions, um, again, uh, and, and thank you for those that shared in the chat box as well. Um, there are challenges, right? Um, so yeah, we really appreciate that, um, for those that shared this evening. So if we'll stick around, if you have any questions, a couple of minutes, if not, we, we thank you again. Um, and I believe in the chat box was also placed from Mina, um, the forms to complete for Act 48. As well as the, the first, uh, by the way, the first link is the evaluation form and the second form is Act 48. Okay, so Thanks. both links are in there. Thank you. Yep, so we'll, we'll stick around here. Um, if you have any questions, if not, we want to thank you again for your attendance and, and for this okay. opportunity. Well, on behalf of PSMLA, we want to thank everybody for attending this session with Anita Young and Barbara Closer. We welcome and encourage your feedback on the sessions. And of course, please, for Pennsylvania, you need to fill in the reflection form for Act 48. And uh, Mina sent the links, but they're also uh, under the PDF uh, program. So... Mm -hmm. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your virtual conference. The Act 48 deadline is 72, 72 hours after this session. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. Thank you.